illegal commercial gambling and bookmaking was so prevalent in Montreal during the interwar period, the city was known as North America's illegal gaming capital. The illegal commercial gambling trade turned many local mathletes into millionaires almost overnight thanks to obscene revenues from their illegal gambling operations. Montreal police weren't concerned with curbing the illegal commercial gambling parlors that were scattered throughout the poor neighborhoods of the city. In fact, the Morality Squad, the task force responsible for policing vice in the city, were effectively paid to look the other way or tip off the bookies prior to raiding their gambling parlors. The systemic corruption of the day allowed the bookmakers to operate almost undisturbed for more than a decade. The vast revenues from bookmaking allowed one of Montreal's top bookies to gamble $100,000 a day in the 1940s until he amassed a huge gambling debt allegedly owed to the New York Cosa Nostra. Rumor has it that the New York Italian mob forced him to hand over his lucrative Quebec-based gambling operations to the New York Mafia, giving the mob the foothold they needed to gain access to the city's underworld and, more importantly, its port. This is the true story of the rise and fall of the Jewish Mafia's gambling empire in Montreal. Welcome to Montreal Mob Stars, the channel devoted to Montreal true crime. If you find historical true crime with a Canadian twist interesting, please help the channel grow by subscribing and liking our content. Gambling in Canada has a history going back to the earliest days of Upper and Lower Canada, with cards and dice games being played by some of the earliest settlers as a means of passing entertainment during long cold nights in homesteads, military barracks, logging camps, and on street corners. Games of chance were unregulated in Canada until 1892 when the House of Commons caved to the pressure put on by the government by Christian morality groups, Protestants who opposed all forms of gambling in Canada. They were successful with lobbying for the legislation that made all forms of gambling illegal in Canada. Following public pressure, raffles with luxury prizes were later allowed in 1900, with horse betting allowed in 1910. The Christian moralists saw how many of the newly forming immigrant communities in Canada's growing cities had gambling parlors run by and for the immigrants of that specific community. As a result of the new legislation that regulated gambling, the Christian moralists emboldened after they successfully lobbied for the anti-gambling legislation, used the law to target the newcomers to Canada. Gambling houses were found in cities and towns across Canada, usually in the poor districts that were typically home to the city's immigrant populations. These illegal commercial gambling parlors were subject to raids by police, resulting in the arrests of those found on premises, along with the seizure of cash and gambling paraphernalia. Immigrants arriving to the New World during the late 18th and 19th centuries came from other parts of the world, with rich and poor alike coming with hopes of carving out a better life in a land where much was still up for grabs. Many of those arriving chose to stay in the port cities they arrived in, as the towns built around the ports along the eastern seaboard became large metropolises including Montreal, New York, Boston, Philadelphia, Baltimore, and others. Within these cities were neighborhoods where certain ethnicities would live together, forming the communities we know today as Little Italy, Chinatown, Little Portugal, Jewish and Latin quarters, and others. Small gangs would often form within these communities, as poverty and lack of places to play were often the factors that set young boys and sometimes girls down a path of crime. Wikipedia's page on the Jewish Mafia described the rise of these gangsters as slum kids who as prepubescent stole from pushcarts, who as adolescents extorted money from store owners, who as young adults practiced slamming, wielded an iron pipe wrapped in newspaper against striking workers or against scabs, until as adults they joined well-organized gangs involved in a wide variety of criminal enterprises boosted by prohibition. That description could loosely apply to almost any of the other ethnic gangs operating around the same time in Montreal, New York, or any of the other rapidly growing cities. Of those included in the mass arrival of immigrants to pass through Montreal's port of entry around the turn of the 20th century were the Lazaroviches, a Jewish family from Romania, who arrived in 1908. Within the family was young Chasco, age 10, who eventually changed his name to Harry Davis. Young Harry was a hard-working immigrant 
who worked long hours for little pay performing the menial jobs available to a young immigrant. He saved what he could from what little he earned working legitimately and ran a side hustle as a petty criminal who would participate in armed robberies, drug dealing, and other crimes with some of the neighborhood boys he grew up with in Montreal's Jewish Quarter. Harry Davis was known to be a mean criminal, a trait that would help him excel as an outlaw while increasing his wealth and power in Montreal's underworld. In 1920, prohibition of alcohol was made into federal law in the United States, forcing many American gangsters to look north of the border for a never-ending supply of booze coming from Quebec. Harry Davis saw how some of the neighborhood hoodlums started making huge money selling liquor to Americans thirsty for booze, and he wanted to make just as much money as they did. Unlike the United States, prohibition of alcohol was never made into a federal law in Canada. Instead, Canada's federal government left the decision to the provinces on whether or not they should go dry. Many of the provinces followed the U.S. decision to ban alcohol. But Quebec only went as far as regulating the sale of alcohol, with the formation of what is today La Société des Alcools de Quebec, or Liquor Commission. This left the province open in terms of drinking and selling alcohol, which made many bootleggers on both sides of the border very rich during the Prohibition era. Any of the people passing through or visiting the city along with its residents could spend their nights in hard-earned cash drinking, gambling, and visiting any of the city's brothels. Harry Davis was making good money in his early 20s from gambling, prostitution, fencing stolen goods, and selling drugs along with his business partner Eddie Kid Baker, a Russian Jewish immigrant who was also a former featherweight boxer. Davis and Baker had a shop on St. Urbain Street in the Jewish Quarter which they used as a base of their criminal operations. Eventually, Davis and Baker's criminal enterprise became known to police, and in 1926, Davis and Baker were arrested and sentenced to less than a year for peddling drugs. During his short prison stint at St. Vincent de Paul Prison, Harry Davis opened a gambling parlor at 1244 Stanley Street in the heart of downtown Montreal, where he offered gamblers an array of games of chance to bet on, including roulette, Baccarat, Blackjack, and Barbot, a dice game that's unique to Quebec. Along with the games of chance, gamblers could place bets on sporting events, election results, etc., with a wall-sized blackboard showing the day's games and races and their respective odds. When a gambler ran out of luck and subsequently ran out of cash at Davis's gambling establishment, Harry Davis or his men would gladly lend the gambler the funds required to continue gambling a practice many legal casinos and bookmakers continue to offer to this day. As the loans came with the high interest rates designed to keep the gambler in debt, the term for this type of loan is usury, which is illegal in most places. This is due to the excessive interest rates and the threat of violence that are often associated with this type of loan, if and when the loan or its staggering interest rates go unpaid. In the late 1920s, Harry Davis teamed up with a New York millionaire named Pincus Pinky Brutcher, who is reported to be a member of the Brooklyn Crime Syndicate Murder Incorporated. Wikipedia describes Murder Inc. as an organization crime group active from 1929 to 1941 that acted as the enforcement arm of the National Crime Syndicate, a closely connected criminal organization that included the Italian-American Mafia, the Jewish Mob, and other criminal organizations in New York City and elsewhere. Murder, Inc. was composed of Jewish and Italian-American gangsters, and members were mainly recruited from poor and working-class Jewish and Italian neighborhoods in Manhattan, primarily the Lower East Side and Brooklyn. Seeing an opportunity to make a boatload of money from the tourists coming to Montreal for its red light district and its nightlife, Harry Davis and Pincus Brecher opened the White House Inn, an upscale gambling house located in La Chine, at the time considered Montreal's suburbia. The suburban location of the White House was a conscious decision on Davis's part, as criminal activity happening outside the city's core was often overlooked by police, which resulted in many gambling parlors opening in the outer reaches of Montreal's city limits. With his first gambling den being located on Stanley Street in downtown Montreal, Davis would almost certainly have been paying police to allow his illegal gambling operations to remain open, and opening the White House Inn in suburbia could have cost less in police bribes than his downtown parlor. The White House Inn was an instant success, with Montrealers and tourists alike 
who came to the White House to bet on winning any of the games of chance or sport betting. Harry Davis was now a successful gangster, making the kinds of money that a young, impoverished immigrant may have dreamt about while keeping hunger at bay. He showed off his wealth by wearing tailored suits that accentuated his lean, small figure. Davis was considered to be one of the top gangsters in Montreal whose power and wealth was obtained from gambling, bootlegging, smuggling, and racketeering. His position of power in the city's underworld also came with the responsibility of keeping corrupt public officials paid so that the commercial gambling enterprises could continue to operate without disruption by Montreal Police's morality squad. The morality squad was specifically tasked with policing prostitution, illegal commercial gambling, illegal drug and alcohol sales, etc. Montreal Police's morality squad, which was created in 1909, earned the reputation as being as corrupt as those they were charged with policing. The morality squad were often paid by bookmakers to leave them alone and continue operations without police scrutiny. When a bookmaker didn't pay off the morality squad, they ran the risk of being raided by the morality squad, who would haul in for questioning anyone found on premises, confiscate and or smash gambling paraphernalia, and slap a padlock onto the door of the gaming den to signify that the police have closed the business. The padlock law was a law that allowed police to physically barricade the doors of a premises that held illegal activity, and many of the bookmakers kept empty rooms with broken gaming tables and a phone not connected to any line on hand for police to confiscate. It was common for the police on a raid to overlook any gambling action on the premises to focus on the doors of those inconsequential rooms, which would be padlocked shut while the illegal activities continued in the next room. Police officers would return to the station with the confiscated goods in hand to write a report stating that the illegal activity had been disrupted and a padlock placed on the door to ensure that the gambling couldn't proceed, even though none of that was true. The padlock law encouraged police corruption at the time as it became a legal loophole for brothel owners, bootleggers, and bookmakers to continue their operations while police were able to claim a win. It was with the funds earned from their illegal commercial gambling that Harry Davis and Pincus Brecher opened a Frolics Cafe in a former fur warehouse on St. Lawrence Street, just above St. Catherine Street. The Frolics Club was an over-the-top, posh nightclub with silk-draped walls whose opulence was new for Montreal. Performers and entertainers would come from the U.S., Europe, and beyond to work at the Frolics Club for two-week stints, ensuring that there was always something new to see at the Frolics. The club was an instant success that made both Davis and Brecher untold wealth, money that they could use to expand their criminal empire. With a legitimate front business now bringing in clean money, the pair were in a position to use the Frolics Club to launder some of the illegal earnings that they received from their legal enterprises, which they may have done. Another gangster from Montreal's Jewish Quarter was Charlie Fagenbaum, who made his money from slot machines he smuggled into Canada and later installed in many of the hotel resorts in the Laurentian Mountains. Fagenbaum's lucrative slot machine operations gave him the title King of the North. At some point in the 1920s, Fagenbaum became involved in the White House Inn along with Davis and Brecher, who were already making huge money with earnings from the White House Inn, the Frolics Cafe, and their other criminal operations. Fagenbaum was described by reporters as a cigar-chomping, overweight, slovenly man who profited handsomely from his gambling operations in the Laurentians and from his business arrangement with Davis and Brecher. Fagenbaum facilitated his smuggling operation by bribing customs officers to allow him to import goods without paying the assigned duty. It's believed by some that Davis and Brecher partnered with Fagenbaum to add a layer of protection in the event that the smuggling ring was broken up by police. Between 1926 until getting caught in October 1930, Charlie Fagenbaum, along with his crew, smuggled $500,000 worth of silk into Canada from the United States, which were moved through the port without paying the estimated $100,000 in duty fees and taxes, thanks to corrupt customs officer Joseph Lapalme. It was reported that silk was imported along with cotton, which was subject to a much lower tariff than silk. One in ten boxes in the shipment contained silk, and customs officer Le Palme would process the shipments using the declarations submitted by the shippers without inspecting the contents. In early 1930, Davis and Brecher started to use connections in Paris, France to smuggle through the port of Montreal heroin, cocaine, and morphine hidden in shipments of legal goods such as toys. The drugs were then driven to New York City by members of Davis's crew, 
where Louis Lepke Buchalter, then the leader of Murder, Inc., awaited the drug's arrival, which was then distributed throughout New York City and its boroughs. Davis, Brecher, and Fagenbaum were successful as they imported heroin, morphine, and cocaine into the U.S. via Montreal, and during the process, countless officials would have had been paid to look the other way. When a shipment with drugs hidden amongst legal goods was to arrive at the port of Montreal, Fagenbaum would be notified by Davis with instructions directing Fagenbaum to the cases in the shipment holding the drugs. Those cases would be removed from the port by Charlie Fagenbaum prior to customs inspection, who would take the cases to the home of his brother Max, or Maxie as he was sometimes called. Harry Davis would then come to Maxie Fagenbaum's home to remove the narcotics from the cases before they returned to the port for customs inspection. Customs and police officers on both sides of the border were paid by Fagenbaum to allow the contraband to be imported while contraband was imported and passed through its smuggling channel to its intended destination. Charlie Fagenbaum didn't retire from the silk smuggling business when he became a successful drug smuggler working with Davis and Brecher, and police caught up with Fagenbaum and his silk smuggling associates in late 1930. In November 1930, charges of smuggling conspiracy to commit smuggling, and possession of smuggled goods were brought against Charlie Fagenbaum, his brother Maxie, Julius Cohen, Louis Briskin, Louis Miller, and then former customs agent Joseph LaPalm. Miller and Briskin both owned garment factories in Montreal, and the pair profited from the smuggling ring by purchasing the silk that was smuggling to Canada, which was used in their garment factories. During the week-long trial, the court heard testimony how Charlie Fagenbaum had what he called a magic formula where goods would be in New York yesterday, Canada today, without any duty paid. Court testimony revealed how Fagenbaum would alert customs agent Joseph Lapalm of incoming shipments that were not to be inspected, with a phone call saying, A friend of mine is coming from New York. He is one of two trucks. Will you look after him? On June 6, 1931, the jury took an hour and a half to find the smuggling crew guilty of all charges. Charlie Fagenbaum was sentenced to five years in prison, Louis Miller four years, Louis Briskin and former customs agent Joseph LaPalm each received two years. With Fagenbaum looking at a lengthy prison stint, he asked his partners to look after his family while he was locked up. As he rotted away in prison, Fagenbaum felt that his partners didn't keep up to the promise to care for the Fagenbaum family and Charlie Fagenbaum decided to become an informant in exchange for a reduced prison sentence. He spoke with the Crown prosecutors and police on numerous occasions, giving them all the information he had to bring those he smuggled with to justice. With his information, the Crown put together a case involving $1 million worth of smuggled silk in 1932, with Charlie Fagenbaum testifying for the Crown and reportedly not sparing any details. Charlie Fagenbaum provided evidence of smuggling by the accused Julius Levine, a former alderman of Montreal, Julius Cohen, Meyer Krasinski, Max Finkelstein, and Louis Miller, all clothing manufacturers or importers of clothing. Charlie Fagenbaum wanted to see all of his partners who betrayed him pay for their refusal to care for the Fagenbaum family while he was in a prison. And while testifying against those accused in the silk smuggling case, he also let it slip that Davis and Brecher had their own smuggling operation. The trial of the silk smugglers concluded with all men found guilty and sentenced to prison. However, Charlie Fagenbaum earned his freedom from testifying against the former silk smugglers. Thanks to Charlie Fagenbaum's testimony, which implicated Davis and Brecher of being drug smugglers, Police began investigating Harry Davis and Pincus Brecher's alleged drug smuggling. In April 1933, Harry Davis was arrested while in possession of 852 kilograms of heroin and other drugs. Fagenbaum's testimony was integral in the part of the Crown's case against Harry Davis, age 31 at the time of his trial, and referred to as Montreal's public enemy number one. Fagenbaum testified that he worked with Davis and Brecher to smuggle heroin shipped from Paris, France into Canada using his smuggling pipeline that he established to smuggle silk into Canada. The heroin was hidden in shipments of toys from Germany, according to Fagenbaum's testimony. Fagenbaum testified to be the liaison between the smugglers and the custom agents, and that he was tasked with sourcing and bribing customs officers who would let the shipments of drugs pass through customs without inspection. In October 1933, 
Harry Davis was found guilty of five separate counts of importing drugs and corrupting law officials. He was sentenced to 14 years in prison and 10 lashes of the whip. Davis received five lashes upon entry at Quebec's St. Vincent de Paul prison, however never received the remaining five lashes. While in custody, Davis refused to snitch on his associates when pressed by investigators or crown prosecutors. And as an appreciation of his loyalty and silence, Davis reportedly received $500 a week while in prison from his associates on the outside. In March 1934, Pincus Brecher was arrested at his home in the Bronx following an extradition request to Canada to face the Canadian justice system for allegedly smuggling narcotics from Europe into Canada while en route to New York. He fought the extradition request with a trial that lasted four months, but when two RCMP agents traveled to New York to testify at his extradition hearings, he lost the fight to stay in the U.S. and was escorted back to Canada under heavy guard. The Pincus Brecher trial was to commence with Charlie Fagenbaum expected to be once again the principal witness for the Crown prosecutors. Fagenbaum was at the time out on bail, trying to live his life normally despite being known as a snitch. It was less than a year following his testimony that sent his boss and other associates to prison and he knew Harry Davis with his infamous temper likely wanted him dead. Charlie Fagenbaum was walking around with a target on his back. He hired a bodyguard and packed heat with a revolver that Charlie kept with him at all times, and he stayed out of the city by hiding out at a family vacation home in the Laurentians. On August 21st, 1934, Charlie left his revolver and bodyguard at the vacation home and took his son Jackie for a day trip to Montreal to run some errands including picking up items at his brother Maxie's home that his sister-in-law had set aside for Charlie. At around 5 p.m., Charlie was standing outside of Maxie's home at 4510 Esplanade, unaware of a car idling nearby with three men patiently waiting within. As Charlie passed parcels through his car's rear window to his son Jackie, a man approached from the idling car across the street and raised a pistol at Charlie. Six shots rang out ending the peaceful summer afternoon. Charlie Fagenbaum was fatally shot in the head and chest by the unknown gunman, who shot his target dead before casually walking back to the waiting car, which drove off northbound, with the gunman conspicuously hanging from the running board. It was a beautiful summer day with people on balconies and the sidewalk enjoying the sunshine. However, nobody came forward to identify the shooter or other occupants of the car. When Montreal police heard of the shooting, they were able to put to use their latest acquisition, two-way police radios, making the Charlie Fagenbaum death the first time Montreal police used car radios to summon all available cars to a crime scene. The death of Charlie Fagenbaum also holds the title as being one of the first gangland-related killings in Montreal. The killer and accomplices were never apprehended. The car was found abandoned a few blocks away without any evidence for police to further their investigation. Later that same day, somebody phoned Montreal police asking if they knew of the Fagenbaum shooting and whether the victim was deceased. When the receptionist replied yes, the caller said good before hanging up. The caller was never identified. Montreal police traced the car to the St. Denis Street dealership where it was purchased, whose records indicated that it was sold to an L. Berkowitz who lived on Guy Street, which police determined to be a fake name and address. Brecher saw how damaging Fagenbaum's testimony was at the Davis trial, and Brecher's upcoming trial weighed heavily on his mind. Brecher might have had many sleepless nights as he sat in a Quebec prison awaiting his trial. Was he wondering, will Charlie Fagenbaum's testimony keep me in a Canadian prison for more than a decade? Brecher, who was a known member of Murder Incorporated, the criminal organization that had hitmen ready and willing to carry out any murder for hire. It's reasonable to assume that Brecher and or Davis could have used hitmen as far away from Montreal as New York City or Chicago to murder Charlie Fagenbaum. Nearly 4,000 onlookers jammed the street in front of Beth David's synagogue to gawk at the body arriving at the synagogue from Charlie Fagenbaum's house across the street. By this time, most of Charlie Fagenbaum's associates had cut their ties with the dead mobster and refused to attend any services or pay their respects, in an effort to avoid being spotted by hidden detectives. A month following the murder of Charlie Fagenbaum, the trial of Pincus Brecher began in Montreal without the Crown's primary witness. Despite the absence of Charlie Fagenbaum's testimony, the Crown prosecutors were able to prove their case that Brecher was the money man of the drug smuggling operation by relying on testimony of bank tellers who processed large wire transfers of cash from New York to Paris on behalf of Brecher. Oddly, 
In most of the articles published about the Brecher trial, he was referred to as a supposed or reputed millionaire as if his fortune was somehow questioned. On September 28, 1934, Pincus Brecher was found guilty of the charges of hoarding drugs and corrupting law officials. Later the same day, while awaiting sentences at Bordeaux Prison, Brecher complained of feeling ill and asked to be taken to the infirmary. While being escorted to the infirmary, Brecher was able to break free from jailers, jumping headfirst from a raised galley to the cement jail floor below. He died instantly as a result of the fall, and his death was ruled a suicide. 1933 was a big year as it ended prohibition in the U.S., which brought to an end the era of the bootlegger. Organized crime groups involved in illicit alcohol sales had to find a new source of revenue, and the Jewish mob in Montreal bet the farm on illegal commercial gambling, and clandestine illegal gambling parlors began to pop up throughout the city. Corruption within those hired to uphold the city's law and order, such as Montreal Police Morality Squad, allowed many of the gambling operations to remain open. Many of the known gambling parlors held municipal business licenses. Some of the gambling dens held licenses to serve food so the gambler may continue to gamble for extended periods, whose kitchens were sometimes extremely unsanitary. Gambling dens that contained a lunch counter would be subject to inspection, and civic health inspectors sent to inspect the cleanliness of the kitchen would overlook the gambling operations happening in the same establishment, often in an adjacent room. Tucked in amongst the legal establishments were the clandestine gambling dens, where anyone could come and spend money at any of the games of chance that were popular at the time, roulette, poker, blackjack, slots, sports betting, and barbat. While Harry Davis was in prison, Davis's former partner, Eddie Kid Baker, expanded his gambling empire in Montreal and its suburbs to become the one who controlled commercial gambling in Montreal. By this time, Kid Baker co-owned a popular nightclub called Gaiety Theatre. Theatres and nightclubs were cash businesses that could easily launder earnings from illegal sources, which could explain why so many bookies of the era also owned nightclubs. Nightclubs such as the Frolics Club and Gaiety Theatre would book some of the top names in the entertainment industry to perform in their clubs. Montreal's St. Catherine Street lit up at night from the Leon glare of the signage of many of the nightclubs along the street, attracting the tourists and locals alike. The flashing lights of the signs for the numerous jazz clubs along streets like St. Catharines and St. Lawrence would advertise the top names in jazz. Some of the black American musicians and artists who came to play in Montreal's jazz clubs would choose to live here, where they enjoyed a less racist atmosphere than in many U.S. cities. In June 1945, Kid Baker died of natural causes, creating a power vacuum in Montreal's gambling underworld, as his vast bookmaking empire was now for grabs. Around the same time, Harry Davis was coincidentally released from prison after serving 12 of the 14 years of his sentence. All of the city's bookmakers closed for two weeks following Kid Baker's death, as the bookmakers secretly conferred to elect a new leader to represent him, much like how cardinals enter a papal conclave to elect a new pope. Harry Davis emerged from the conference as the city's edge man, a Montreal term for someone who collected bribes, reported to be 20% of the gambling parlor's revenue, on behalf of the criminal organization. The Edgemen then distributed the bribes amongst the city's corrupt officials, who were paid to allow the illegal gambling to continue uninterrupted. Another key responsibility of the Edgemen was to regulate the number of bookmaking and gambling establishments that could operate in the city. Anyone looking to open a gambling house in Montreal had to seek permission from Harry Davis, who held the power to make or break an aspiring bookie's dream. Any of the established bookies who didn't pay Davis for protection or opened a gambling house without permission were subject to intimidation, such as raids by police, following an anonymous tip from Davis or his crew. And if those tactics didn't work, Davis would threaten violence or order the offending bookmaker's establishment to be burned to the ground. It was reported that the bribes of all the Montreal bookmakers paid added up to $5,000 in weekly bribe money that Harry Davis used to corrupt public officials, judges, police, etc. Given that the internet and mass communication wasn't available in the 1940s, results of sports games and horse and dog races from across North America weren't as easily or readily available to the sports betting community as they are today. 
To ensure that bookmakers had the most precise and timely results, they subscribed to a sports wire service that provided the scores of sports games and racetracks to bookmakers through a paid subscription service that delivered the results via phone or telegraph wire. The owners of these sports wire services were often organized crime figures associated with bookmaking themselves, who increased their wealth by charging other bookmakers, including their competition, a subscription fee to receive the results of the day's games and races. Bookmakers relied on a sports wire service to transmit the final scores of games and races to their gambling operations. This was more than 50 years before the advent of Sportsnet or ESPN, and at the time, there was no other way to receive up-to-the-minute sports results. Following the death of Kid Baker, Harry Davis gained control of Montreal's sports wire service along with his duties as the city's edgeman. The criminal enterprise that Davis established needed musclemen to enforce their demands, protect the operations from the degenerate gamblers who hung out at their establishments, and to collect debts. One of those men was Louis Greco, who Davis met while in prison. Greco was a career criminal who entered into the world of crime at the age of 10, following his father's death on the Canadian Pacific Railroad in 1923. Greco, who had an established reputation as being a tough guy, worked for Davis as his personal driver and bodyguard. In the spring of 1945, a man named Louis Berkovich, a name that's suspiciously similar to the fake name used to buy the getaway car in the Charlie Fagenbaum murder, approached Davis for permission to open a gambling den. Thinking that there were already enough gambling dens already operating in Montreal, Davis refused Berkovich's request and issued a warning that if Berkovich went ahead with his plans, he would be taken care of just as easily as Charlie Fagenbaum. On July 25, 1945, Louis Berkovich returned to Davis's gambling parlor on Stanley Street. His motivation was reportedly to smooth things over with Davis. However, the meeting escalated quickly. Berkovich later testified that Davis threatened his life and reached for a pistol, but Berkovich was able to fire his weapon first. He shot Davis dead in front of a room full of gamblers. Berkovich fled the scene of Davis's murder and went to the offices of the now-defunct newspaper The Montreal Herald, where he was interviewed by managing editor Ted McCormick, who kept Berkovich in the office overnight for his protection. The night of the Davis murder, the city was chaotic as mobsters roamed the streets looking for the assassin. Every available police officer was called into work to patrol the streets, and the night passed without any major incidents. The following day, Berkovich turned himself into police. Berkovich later admitted that he killed Davis because he felt his life was threatened after hearing a rumor that Davis had dispatched Hitman to wipe out Berkovich. In the days following the death of Davis, the city's Jewish community were shocked that once again a gangland murder was attributed to members of its community. Canada Adler, a local Jewish newspaper, editorialized in its Yiddish edition if the police had not been corrupt and had not taken bribes, gambling houses would not be able to operate and the Harry Davises of the world would perhaps be forced to earn a living in the usual manner. When the services were held for Harry Davis, 5,000 onlookers attended outside the funeral home shutting down St. Turbain Street on the day of the service. The death of Harry Davis marked the beginning of the fall of the Jewish Mafia's gambling empire as public outrage over the fact that those in power allowed gambling to carry on without punishment, ultimately bringing violence to the streets. The wave of outrage forced the city to make drastic changes, including within the ranks of Montreal Police, which we'll discuss in the second part of our series on Montreal's Jewish Mafia and their gambling empire. If you have yet to subscribe to our channel, please subscribe and hit the bell so you're notified when we release the conclusion of this series. Thanks again for watching Montreal Mobstars.